Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we'll be discussing the case of Hashu Jonas, the first honour killing victim in the UK. Hashu's case is tragic and it highlights the concerning cases of honour killings within the UK. Hashu Jonas was born in Iraqi Kurdistan in 1986 to Kurdish parents Abdallah and Tanya Jonas. Kurdistan is a mountainous region spread across Iraq, Turkey, Iran and Syria and is home to around 40 million Kurds. The region and its people have been subjected to decades of war and in the 1980s and 1990s it was suffering under the regime of Saddam Hussein. Heshu's father spent most of his life fighting against Iraqi forces as he was part of the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. However, after many of his extended family members were killed by Saddam Hussein's regime, he requested asylum to the UK and moved permanently in 1993. The family became part of the small yet tightly knit Kurdish community within London. Despite attempts to integrate into Western society, a stark difference in the culture between the Kurdish community and the Western community was prevalent. Most notably, the traditional gender roles defined in Kurdish society, where a woman's role is limited to being a wife and a mother who looks after the household and family, and men are breadwinners, fathers and head of the family. Women have a lower status in the family as men dominate the private space through patrilineal relationships, financial decisions and selecting partners for their children. Female virginity upon marriage is a requirement and women are expected to show respect and politeness to men. Breaching such norms devalue women to the point of being perceived as shameful and dishonourable. Heshu, then five, enrolled in the local primary school in Acton, West London and at first, not speaking any English, struggled to keep up with her classmates. However, in no time at all, she had gotten a good grasp of English and was a bubbly and chatty child. At age 11, Heshu enrolled in Acton High School and her chatty and bubbly personality continued to impress those around her. Heshu became a popular student at this diverse yet later controversial high school. As Heshu progressed through her school years, she, like many of her classmates, enjoyed listening to music, watching movies and gushing over boys. This, however, was in stark contrast to the expectations held for her at home. Heshu's conservative family expected Heshu to keep a respectable public profile that would retain the honour of their family within the Kurdish community in London at the time. Heshu felt the pressure from her family to conform to their expectations and thus Heshu began to live a double life where she was the obedient daughter at home and a normal teenage girl at school. Heshu would wait until she had left home to apply her makeup and change into western clothes when socialising with friends and attending high school. When Heshu was 16, she joined William Morris Academy in Hammersmith and Fulham, where she met 18-year-old Nizam al Khuri, who was of Lebanese descent. The pair soon began a whirlwind romance and soon fell in love with each other. However, because of Heshu's strict family life, the relationship remained a secret. Heshu would tell her parents that she was meeting friends when in fact she was secretly meeting her boyfriend. And although Nizam was keen to make the relationship official and ask for her hand in marriage, Heshu warned Nizam that if her family were to find out about their relationship, there would be dire consequences for her. And so the pair continued to meet in secret. Despite the secrecy of the relationship, the pair had been spotted together by locals in the Kurdish community and rumours had started to filter through to Heshu's father, Abdallah. As the summer break approached, Heshu and her family returned to Iraqi Kurdistan for a family holiday. Heshu worried that her father was planning on forcing her into a marriage in Kurdistan and so the teenager had left her passport details and a video diary with her friend in the UK in hopes it would aid her safe return to the UK if required. Whilst on holiday, Heshu was forced to undergo a virginity test which she allegedly failed, thus rendering her unmarriageable within the Kurdish community. Heshu claimed her father Abdallah had held a gun to her head as a result of this. As soon as Heshu returned to the UK, she started to make plans to run away. She wrote a letter that she later planned to leave to her father in which she wrote, Bye Dad, sorry I was so much trouble. Me and you will probably never understand each other, but I'm sorry I wasn't what you wanted. But there's some things you can't change. 
Hey, for an older man, you have a good strong punch and kick. I hope you enjoy testing your strength on me. It was fun being on the receiving end. Well done. One day, when I get a proper job, every penny I owe you will be repaid in full. I'm sure in saying I will be safe. I will find a way to independently look after myself. I'll go to social security and get myself a flat or a hostel. I will be okay. Don't look for me because I don't know where I'm going yet. I just want to be alone. Six weeks after returning from the holiday in Kurdistan, Abdallah received an anonymous letter in which it was claimed that the Kurdish community was aware that Heshu had a boyfriend and she was referred to as a slut and a prostitute. Heshu was aware of the letter and became increasingly concerned about her staying in the home with her father. The letter became a catalyst for what was to come. Two days after the letter was received on the 12th of October, Heshu was left alone in the house for the first time with her father. An argument had broken out between the pair and Heshu became disturbed by her father's behaviour and ran into the family bathroom and barricaded herself in. However, this was no match for Abdallah's rage. He smashed through the bathroom door with a knife in his hand and stabbed Heshu 11 times. The last blow was wielded with such ferocity that the tip of the blade broke off when it hit a bone in her neck. Before Abdallah struck the final blow, he held his daughter down over the bath and slit her throat. She bled to death on the bathroom floor, wedged between the bath and the toilet. When her body was discovered, the white handle knife was still sticking out of her throat. Immediately after the murder, Abdallah cut his own throat and threw himself from the third floor balcony in an attempt to end his own life. However, after many months in hospital, he survived. Following the murder of Heshu, many in the Kurdish community and those known to Abdallah, including his family, came to his support. Attempts were made to stop the police from interviewing Abdallah and an elaborate story was concocted in his defence. Abdallah's son and Heshu's brother claimed that members of the terrorist group Al-Qaeda had broken into the family home, killed Heshu and attempted to kill Abdallah. They attempted to portray a harmonious family life in the face of evidence to the contrary, such as the testimony of her friends, videos that Heshu had recorded and the letter she had written to her father when planning to run away. The police also noticed that members of the Kurdish community tried to protect him and help him cover up Heshu's murder. It was claimed that witnesses were threatened and the community tried to raise money for his bail, which in any case was declined due to credible information a plan was in place to help him flee. Abdallah claimed he was innocent and therefore a trial date was set. However, days before the trial was due to begin, Abdallah changed his plea to guilty on the charge of murder. After finally acknowledging that he had killed his daughter, Abdallah Yonas tried to claim a defence of diminished responsibility and then provocation. He was sentenced at the Old Bailey on the 30th of September 2003. He asked that the judge sentence him to death for what he had done. In his sentencing remarks, Judge Denison referred to a tragic story of cultural differences between traditional Kurdish values and the values of Western society, and when sentencing Jonas to life in prison, noted cultural differences in mitigation when setting a minimum tariff of 14 years. Following the sentence, a task force was set up by the lead officer in the case in order to investigate honour-related crimes and a review was conducted on files from the last decade in an effort to identify if they had been motivated by honour. Within the next 12 months, at least 13 of the cases reviewed had been identified as honour-related. Heshu's murder became the first honour killing in the UK and the British media used it as a tool to forward an us-and-them agenda. Many media outlets mistakenly claimed that the murder was motivated by Heshu's boyfriend being Christian and Heshu's Muslim father not approving of this. However, Nizam, Heshu's boyfriend, had revealed to the newspaper The Evening Standard that he was also Muslim and the disapproval of the relationship was not motivated by religion but rather a sense of honour that Heshu was disrespecting. It has been almost two decades since the murder of Heshu and unfortunately, Honour killings have continued to plague communities across the UK. Heshu's legacy is that of a kind, bubbly and charismatic young girl and the brutality in which she was murdered has left a shadow over the Kurdish community. And that brings us to the end of today's case. 
I was quite surprised with my research into this case because I'd never heard about it and uh, honour killings tend to make the headlines and sort of stay in the headlines but um, it was one that I, I hadn't heard of before and I've not seen any videos being done on this so I thought it would be a good case to bring attention to. Um, so as always guys I'd appreciate your support by liking this video and subscribing to the channels and I'll see you guys on the next one.